Welcome. In this lecture, I shall discuss eight cycle refrigeration systems. So, the specific objectives of this lesson uh, to discuss reverse Kano cycle and its limitations, uh, to discuss reverse Brayton cycle, both ideal as well as actual, and discuss various aircraft refrigeration cycles, namely simple systems, a bootstrap system, a regenerative system, etc. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to uh, describe various air cycle refrigeration systems, state the assumptions made in the analysis of air cycle systems, show the cycles on TS diagrams, perform various cycle calculations and state the significance of dry air rated temperature. Now, let's, let me give a brief introduction. Air cycle refrigerant systems belong to the general class of glass, uh, gas cycle refrigerant systems in which a gas is used as the working fluid. So, here the working fluid is a gas and uh, this gas does not undergo any phase change during the cycle. That means, basically this cycle is uh, all the processes in this cycle are essentially sensible heat transfer processes. Uh, there are no uh, phase change processes and applications of gas cycle refrigerant systems are in the areas of aircraft cabin cooling and liquefaction of various gases. In the particular, uh, this particular lecture, I uh, will be uh, confining myself to air cycle refrigerant systems. Uh, so, the uh, liquefaction of various gases and all will not be discussed here. Uh, before we uh, take up the various cycles, uh, I would like to mention here an important uh, type of analysis known as air standard cycle analysis. Uh, air cycle system analysis is simplified by making the following assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that the working fluid is considered to be a mixed fixed mass of air which behaves as an ideal gas. The cycle is assumed to be a closed loop cycle, all the internal processes are reversible and the specific heat of air remains constant throughout the cycle. This particular analysis is what is known as cold air standard cycle analysis. You might have studied uh, in thermodynamics, uh, you might have used this particular analysis uh, for analyzing gas power cycles. So, we will be using the same uh, type of uh, assumptions and same type of analysis for gas cycle refrigerant systems also. This analysis uh, gives reasonably accurate uh, results uh, for almost all situations except for the process of throttling. Because if you remember uh, from the last uh, lecture, uh, the throttling, uh, cooling during throttling uh, depends mainly on the real gas behavior. So, if you are assuming the gas to be ideal, then during the throttling there would not be any temperature reduction. So, as I said, uh, this uh, cold air standard cycle analysis is good for all the processes except the throttling. In the cycles that I am going to discuss in this particular lesson, we will not be uh, encountering throttling process. So, this particular uh, analysis is good for us at this uh, juncture. So, let us look at some basic concepts. Uh, how do we reduce the temperature of an ideal gas? We cannot reduce the temperature of an ideal gas by throttling, that is uh, what we have seen in the last class. Then what are the other ways of reducing the temperature? You can reduce the temperature by making the gas to do work in an isentropic process or by sensible heat exchange with a cooler environment. So, if, you, if the gas is doing work in an isentropic process, obviously its enthalpy or internal energy reduces as a result its temperature also reduces. The second way of reducing its temperature is by exchanging heat with a cooler medium. So, in the cycles that we are going to discuss in this particular lecture, we will be mainly relying on the isentropic process for reducing the temperature. When the gas does adiabatic work, its internal energy drops in a closed system and enthalpy drops in an open system. That means, whenever uh, when the process is adiabatic, uh, that means there is no heat uh, supply uh, to the system. Uh, nor heat supply from the system and at the same time the system is doing work. Obviously, it will be doing work at the cost of its own energy. If, uh, if it is in a closed system, then it will be in uh, its internal energy. If it is an open system, it will be enthalpy. So, it will be doing performing the work at the cost of its internal energy or enthalpy. Since it is delivering a net work output, obviously the internal energy or enthalpy have to reduce. Once these two are reducing, since we are assuming the um, uh, working fluid to behave as an ideal gas, obviously the temperature has to reduce because uh, internal energy and enthalpy of ideal gases are uh, uh, functions of temperature only. So, temperature of the gas decreases during the process. So, you can see here uh, for example, uh, a closed system undergoing an isentropic process 1 to 2. 
So, the work output is given by m into u1 minus u2 which can be written as mcv into t1 minus t2 where m is the mass of the system undergoing uh, the isentropic process, u1 and u2 are the specific uh, internal energies at the beginning of the process and at the end of the process, t1 and t2 are the temperatures at the beginning and end of the process and cv is, as you know is the specific, specific heat at constant volume. So, since W is positive, U1 is greater than U2, so obviously T1 will be greater than T2. So, this is a typical equation for an isentropic process uh, of a closed system. Of course, you can derive this very easily by applying the first law of thermodynamics to a closed system. Heat transfer rate is 0, so work transfer rate is equal to change in the internal energy. If you apply the same uh, first law of thermodynamics to an open system, uh, then you get uh, the equation in the form. Uh, w is m dot into h1 minus h2 which can be written as m dot cp into t1 minus t2 where w is the power uh, power output m dot is the mass flow rate of the working fluid h1 and h2 are the in, uh, initial and final enthalpies t1 and t2 are the initial and final temperatures and cp is the specific heat at constant pressure and for both uh, closed as well as open systems you can very easily show that whenever an ideal gas is undergoing isentropic expansion the temperature is related to pressure that is given by this relation shown here T2 is equal to T1 into P2 by P1 to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma where gamma as you know is uh, equal to Cp by Cv for ideal gases. This equation can be very easily derived by applying two equations. One is ideal gas equation of state that is PV is equal to RT and the second is uh, the process equation for an isentropic process that is PV to the power of gamma is constant. So, if you are using the equation PV is equal to RT and also P v to the power of gamma is equal to constant, then you can uh, get this expression for the temperatures in terms of the pressure ratios. Now, let us uh, begin our discussion with an ideal cycle called a reverse Carnot uh, cycle for gases. This is an ideal cycle for constant temperature, heat source and sink. That means, whenever we have an external uh, heat source or, or sink, which is at a constant temperature, then the reverse Carnot cycle is the ideal cycle. So, it is a completely reversible cycle. So, let me um, describe this cycle now. Yeah, so, this cycle consists of uh, four processes. First process, process 1 to 2 is isentropic compression, process 2 to 3 is isothermal compression, process 3 to 4 is isentropic expansion, 4 to 1 is isothermal expansion. So, this can be um, opt achieved uh, either by using a closed system concept or an open system concept. For example, you can have isentropic compression, expansion, etcetera using a piston cylinder device in, the, in which case the system becomes a closed system or you can also have an open system where uh, there is a steady flow of the working fluid through each component. So, what the example I have shown here is for a, an open system. So, typically steady flow energy equations can be applied to each of the components. Okay. So, the first process, uh, process 1 to 2, this is as I said is an isentropic uh, compression. This is achieved in a uh, compressor uh, which compresses the working fluid from point 0.1 to point 0.2 in an isentropic manner. In fact, it is an irreversible, I should mention that it should be reversible adiabatic compression process which turns out to be an isentropic process. So, the, for this process you have to supply some work input. Okay. Let that work input be W 1 to 2 okay. and there is no heat transfer because this is an adiabatic process. Okay. So, W 1 2 is the work transfer during this process. This is the work input to the uh, compressor. Next what happens is uh, the gas which is now at a high, uh, high temperature and high pressure Oh, uh, undergoes what is known as an isothermal compression. Okay, you can see that process 2 to 3 is an isothermal compression. That means, its temperature remains constant during the process at the same time its pressure increases. Okay, this is a compression process. So, you have to supply uh, work input to the compressor. Since, its temperature has to remain constant, obviously there must be some heat transfer and if you are applying steady flow energy equation, you can easily show that the work input should be same as the heat transfer rate. So, that your temperature remains constant for the ideal gas. Okay. And uh, process 3 to 4 uh, that is taking place in a, an isentropic turbine. So, during this process it gives out actually a work output. Okay. Uh, so, this is a work output from the turbine and this is as I said is an isentropic process. So, during this process its pressure and temperature and enthalpy everything reduces. So, the enthalpy temperature and pressure at point 4 will be lower than at point 3. 
okay and the actually what is done here you can see that the turbine and the compressor are uh, coupled here that means the work output of the turbine is supplied to the compressor okay so the net work output here will be uh, w12 minus w34 okay uh, the next process uh, is what is known as uh, isothermal expansion process 4 to 1 this takes place in a isothermal turbine its temperature has to remain constant at the same time it has to extract heat heat from a low temperature reservoir that means here it will be rejecting heat to a high temperature uh, heat sink and it will be extracting heat from a high temperature heat uh, reservoir or heat source okay uh, since its uh, temperature has to remain constant that means obviously this process will take place uh, only when some work is done and this QL will be same as equal to WL okay and this is the useful uh, refrigeration effect, useful uh, cooling effect. So, we have uh, four uh, two uh, compressors and two turbines, one compressor is an isentropic compressor, one compressor is an isothermal compressor, one turbine is isentropic turbine, the other one is isothermal turbine. Let me show this uh, cycle on TS and PV diagrams. Okay, so, here you can see the TS and PV diagrams here. Oh, you can see that this is the two phase reason. Okay. Since this is a gas cycle, the complete uh, cycle will be taking place away from the two phase reason. So, you do not really have any liquid phase. Okay. And the four processes described earlier, uh, process 1 to 2, isentropic compression, uh, you can see that the x axis is entropy and y axis is temperature. So, isentropic compression means it will be a vertical line from uh, a low pressure P1 to an intermediate pressure P2. Okay. So, this is a vertical line and the process 2, 3 is uh, isothermal uh, compression okay so pressure increases again from p2 to p3 at the same time the temperature remains constant and during this process this much amount of heat is transferred okay and process 3 to 4 is isentropic expansion in the turbine entropy remains constant temperature falls and process 4 to 1 is isothermal uh, isothermal uh, expansion so you have to supply heat q4 to 1 which is the refrigeration effect here and the same process is shown here on PV diagram. Okay, so, 1 to 2 is isentropic process, 2 to 3 is isothermal, 3 to 4 is again isentropic and 4 to 1 is uh, again isothermal process. And uh, by applying uh, our TDS relations and uh, first and second law equations, you can show that the heat transfer during the process Q2 uh, 2 to 3 is integral uh, TDS from 2 to 3 and temperature remains constant, let this temperature be TH. Okay. Then Q2 to 3 is nothing but integral uh, TDS which is equal to TH into S2 minus S3. Similarly, uh, heat transfer during the process 4 to 1 is integral T, uh, TDS from 4 to 1 which is equal to TL S1 minus S4 where TL is the low temperature. So, basically the Carnot cycle operates between two temperatures, one is a low temperature and the other one is a high temperature and this is the heat transfer during the heat rejection process and heat transfer during the heat extraction process. And now, if you apply the first law of thermodynamics to the entire cycle. So, as you know, our first law is nothing but cyclic integral of dou Q should be equal to cyclic integral of dou W. Okay. So, what is the heat different heat transfer rates uh, to heat transfers during the cycle? We have heat transfer taking place only during two processes, process 2 to 3 and process 4 to 1. And Q41 is positive because you are supplying heat to the cycle and Q2 to 3 is negative because heat is being rejected from the cycle. So, you, we are following the sign convention. So, uh, so, cyclic integral of dou Q is equal to Q4 to 1 minus Q2 to 3 and uh, cyclic integral of dou W is uh, nothing but net work input to the system. Okay. And then the COP of the system is defined as the uh, cooling effect divided by the net work input that is Q4 to 1 divided by W net. Okay. So, if you are substituting uh, uh, these expressions here, you will ultimately find that COP of the Carnot cycle is simply equal to TL divided by TH minus TL. That means, it is only a function of TL and TH. Okay. So, it is independent of your working fluid and all that. This is one uh, very peculiar uh, this thing of uh, Carnot cycle. It is only a function of or temperatures. Okay. And for you, from the expression, you can see that COP increases as TL increases uh, and COP also increases as TH reduces. So, basically the COP of a Kano system increases as the temperature difference between the uh, high temperature and low temperature reduces. Okay. So, we have seen that the COP is a function of high and low temperatures only. 
And what are the limitations of, um, as I said, this is an ideal cycle. So normally, Kano cycle uh, cannot be built in practice, but this is used as a reference. So normally, we use it as a standard and we compare the actual cycles with the Kano cycles just to know how good uh, is our cycle compared to the best possible cycle. Okay. So the best possible or the ideal cycle is most of the cases Kano cycle. Okay. But as I said, Kano cycle is not possible uh, in practice. Uh, especially Kano gas cycle is not possible uh, in practice because of the limitations. What are the limitations? The first limitation is that uh, the isothermal compression and expansion are difficult to achieve in practice. So you have seen that process 2 to 3 and process 4 to 1 are isothermal processes at the same time some work transfer has to take place. Okay, so this is very difficult to achieve especially when we are uh, dealing with uh, high speed uh, turbines or high speed uh, compressors. They will be operating uh, closer to adiabatic conditions than isothermal conditions. So achieving iso isothermal compression and isothermal expansion is uh, very difficult. So normally it is not pra uh, possible in practice. So this is the first limitation. The second limitation is that uh, Kano gas uh, cycle offers very small volumetric refrigeration capacity. As a result, the amount of air uh, that has to be handled by the system will be very, very large. So this is another uh, practical limitation. So you really do not find any reverse Kano cycle uh, working in practice. So now let us look at a cycle which actually uh, found uh, in practice, okay, which can be built. Okay, this is high volumetric flow rates. So such a cycle is known as uh, reverse Brayton cycle. Let us first look at ideal reverse Brayton cycle. This is actually a modification of uh, Kano cycle and this is also known as Bell-Coleman cycle or sometimes uh, as Joule cycle. Okay. So uh, Bell-Coleman cycle, reverse Brayton cycle and Joule cycle mean the same thing. And this is widely used in aircraft refrigeration and this cycle is internally reversible. Kano cycle is both internally as well as externally reversible. So you call Kano cycle as a completely reversible cycle. That means the heat transfer rate, for example, you take a heat transfer process in a Kano cycle. It has to be internally reversible and it has to be externally reversible. That means heat transfer between the external source or sink and the working fluid must take place reversibly. That means there should not be any temperature difference between the a source or sink and the working fluid. Okay, then you call and there are no internal irreversibilities also. Such cycles you call as completely reversible cycle. The Brayton cycle that we are going to discuss now, they have to be internally reversible. That means there should not be any internal uh, irreversibility such as friction, uh, fluid friction, etc. Let me show the cycle uh, now. Okay, so uh, what I am showing here is a, a schematic of the cycle. So it consists of uh, four components. One is uh, a compressor, a high temperature heat exchanger, a turbine and a low temperature heat exchanger. Okay. So if you see, if you see the, uh, compare this cycle with Kano uh, cycle, you will find that there are two changes. The first change is that the isothermal compression uh, here is replaced by a heat exchanger. That means isothermal uh, compressor is replaced by a heat exchanger. Similarly, the isothermal turbine is replaced by a low temperature heat exchanger. Okay. Now, what are the four processes uh, in this particular cycle? The first process, process 1 to 2 is isentropic compression. Okay, so the air or working fluid gets compressed isentropically in the compressor, so it is isentropic compression. And process 2 to 3 is isobaric heat rejection. This was isothermal heat rejection in case of Kano cycle, but in the isothermal process is replaced by isobaric process uh, in Brayton cycle. Okay, so process 2 to 3 is isobaric heat rejection. Then process 3 to 4 is isentropic expansion and process 4 to 1 is isobaric heat extraction. So the uh, only changes are in the process 2 to 3 and 4 to 1. Process 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 are same as Kano cycle. Okay, so this is the simple reverse Brayton cycle. Now let me show this cycle on uh, TS diagram. Before I show this cycle, let me uh, once again uh, uh, point it out that here we have clubbed the, uh, the shaft of the turbine is connected to the shaft of the compressor. That means the work output of the compressor turbine is supplied to the compressor. Okay. So still uh, this cycle requires some positive net work input to the system. Okay. You can never have uh, the work output of the turbine greater than the work input required for the compressor because that will violate the second law. Okay. So there must be always some net work input to the system. Okay. So that net work input is the difference between the work of the compressor minus the work of the turbine. Okay. 
So, uh, now the process is shown on uh, TS diagram as uh, you can easily see that you have two uh, pressures here. Let us say that this is uh, uh, PH or uh, okay, P2 and this is P1 and this P is constant. So, P2, P2 is equal to P3 and this is again an isobar. So, P1 is equal to P4 okay. and uh, P2 is greater than obviously P1. right? So, process 1 to 2 is isentropic compression. So, it is a vertical line. Process 2 to 3 is isobaric heat rejection that means along the constant pressure line and during this process you can see that the, the temperature of the air drops from T2 to T, uh, T3 and process T, uh, 3 to 4 is isentropic uh, expansion in the turbine. Okay. Uh, so, it is again a vertical line and process 4 to 1 is again isobaric heat extraction from the heat source. That means basically you have uh, heat extraction from the low temperature heat source and heat rejection at this point. Okay. And as you know if you are using it for cooling this is our required uh, cooling output. Okay. Now, let me we can quickly write uh, the uh, equations for various processes. For example, process 1 to 2, what we are doing is we are simply applying the steady flow energy equation. We are neglecting uh, neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energies. Okay. So, these are the two assumptions. Uh, apart from that, we are following the cold air standard cycle analysis okay, that you must keep in mind always for this lecture. Okay. So, for uh, process 1 to 2 is uh, uh, isentropic compression. So, there is no heat transfer, only work transfer takes place. So, this is the work input to the compressor. This is simply equal to mass flow rate of the air into H2 minus H1. This is enthalpy change during the compression process. Okay. So, m dot into H2 minus H1. So, H2 minus H1 is written as Cp into T2 minus T1, where Cp is the specific heat. T2 and T1 are the final and initial temperatures uh, for the compressor. Okay. And process uh, 2 to 3 if you remember is isobaric heat rejection. Okay. During this process, uh, there is no work uh, done. That means, there is no work transfer during this process. Okay. So, W23 is 0 because this process was performed in a heat exchanger. So, no work uh, was done. So, when this is 0 and when again uh, delta Ke and delta P are negligible, if you are applying steady flow energy equation, you can easily show that Q223 is m dot into H2 minus H3, which is equal to m dot Cp into T2 minus T3. And process uh, 3 to 4 is isentropic expansion. So, q dot 3 to 4 is 0. Okay. So, w 3 to 4 is q m dot into h 3 minus h 4, which is equal to m dot C p into t 3 minus t 4. And finally, process 4 to 1, again work is 0 during this process and it is isobaric heat rejection. So, you can write this as m dot into h 1 minus h 4, which is equal to m dot C p into t 1 minus t 4. Again, for the process 1 to 2, you can get this equation very easily. As I was mentioning in the uh, little while ago, you can get this expression. How do you get it? We can write P v is R t and P 1 V 1 to the power of gamma is P 2 V 2 to the power of gamma. Okay. So, if you are using these two equations, you can arrive at this expression. Okay. So, what it uh, shows is uh, the exit temperature of the compressor is equal to the inlet temperature multiplied by the pressure ratio to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma, where gamma is as you know is Cp by Cv. Okay. I am writing this as T1 into Rp to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma, where Rp is equal to P2 by P1. So, this is called as pressure ratio. We have only two pressures in this cycle, so this is the pressure ratio. Okay. Similar uh, to uh, the process 1 to 2, process 3 to 4, process 3 to 4 is isentropic uh, expansion. So, again you can get this equation for the process 3 to 4, where uh, T3 is equal to T4 into P3 by P4 to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma, which is again equal to T4 into pressure ratio to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma. Okay. So, from these two relations, you can very easily show that T2 by T1 is equal to T3 by T4. Okay. And now, we apply the first law of thermodynamics for the entire cycle. So, as you know cycling integral of del q is equal to cycling integral of del w and uh, heat transfer uh, took place in two, uh, two processes 4 to 1 and 2 to 3 and this is positive uh, because it is taking heat from the heat source. So, for, for q 4 to 1 is positive, it is rejecting heat. So, q 2 to 3 is negative okay. and there are two work, uh, work transfer processes process 3 to 4 that is the isentropic expansion in the turbine. It is positive because system is doing the work and uh, this is the work input to the compressor. It is negative because you are supplying the work to the system. Okay. 
and this thing is equal to W net, right. So, finally, you find that W net is equal to Q4 minus Q4 to 1 minus Q2 to 3. So, COP again we are defining as Q4 to 1 divided by W net. So, you can very easily show that this is equal to T1 minus T4 divided by T2 minus T1 minus T3 minus T4. And this uh, we can uh, easily show because as I said, uh, you can write this expression uh, T2 by T1 we have just now shown is equal to T3 by T4. So, if you are using this expression here, you can arrive at this uh, equation okay and you can also write cop in terms of pressure ratios okay so again uh, the relation you remember the relation i have shown just now so ultimately you can express cop in terms of pressure ratios and gamma okay so finally the cop of the ideal reverse brayton cycle becomes a function of the pressure ratio and it is very easy to show that cop reduces as pressure ratio increases okay that means uh, uh, higher the pressure ratio, smaller will be the COP. Okay, so these are the typical equations, and it is very easy to derive these equations on your own. All that you have to do is take each component and apply steady flow energy equation to the component. Okay, and assume the CP to be constant. Neglect uh, kinetic and potential energy changes, and apply steady, as I said, the steady flow energy equation to all the components. Okay. Right, so we have seen that uh, this is I have already mentioned the two isothermal heat transfer processes uh, are replaced by two isobaric heat transfer processes. And for the same heat exchange at terminal temperatures, you can very easily show that the COP of a reverse Carnot cycle is always greater than the COP of a Brayton cycle. Okay, let me show this. Right, I will show this uh, a blank sheet. Okay. So, what I am showing here is the reverse Brayton cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, right. So, you have to uh, isobaric processes here, okay. process uh, 2 to 3 and 4 to 1 are isobaric uh, processes, process 1 to 2 and 3 4 are isentropic processes. Okay. And if you am fixing the terminal temperature of uh, hot and cold heat exchanger, that means uh, if you am fixing uh, uh, temperature at point 1 and temperature at point 3, uh, then uh, 1, 2 dash, 3, 4 dash will be uh, a Carnot cycle which has the same terminal heat exchanger temperature as that of a reverse uh, Brayton cycle. Okay. Right. So, now for the reverse Brayton cycle, just now we have shown that the efficiency is given by T4 divided by T3 minus T4. That means, this temperature divided by this temperature minus this temperature. Okay. What is the COP of the Carnot cycle? COP of the Carnot cycle is obviously uh, depending upon these two temperatures, okay, TH and TL. Here, TH and TL are nothing but uh, T3 and T1. So, Carnot cycle COP is given by T1 divided by T3 minus T1. Okay. So, this will always be lower than this. Why? Because T4 is always lower than T1. Okay. T4 is always less than T1. As a result, COP of the Brayton cycle will always be less than the COP of a reverse Carnot cycle. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, actual reverse Brayton cycle. What are we have been discussing so far is an ideal cycle. So, the actual cycle differs from ideal cycle due to two reasons. The first reason is the non isentropic compression and expansion processes. That means, basically the process 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 could be adiabatic, but they will be definitely irreversible. That means, there will be some uh, irreversibility may be due to fluid friction. Okay. So, the process becomes non isentropic. This is the first difference between the ideal cycle and the actual cycle. And the second uh, difference is we have neglected all the pressure drops in the cold and hot heat exchangers. Typically, when a fluid flows through a heat exchanger consisting of long lengths of tubes, uh, there will be fluid friction and uh, pressure drops. Okay. In the ideal cycle, we consider that there are no pressure drops. So, you have only uh, two pressures, whereas in actual cycle, there will be pressure drops 
right. So, these are the two uh, reasons uh, uh, why actual cycle differs from an ideal cycle. I can show the this thing on a, so you can uh, see the difference here, here 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the ideal cycle. Okay, and 1, 2 dash, uh, 3, 4 dash, this is 0.4 dash, okay. So, 1, 2 dash, 3, 4 dash is the actual cycle, okay. So, you can see that for example, process 1 to 2, in the ideal cycle it is an isentropic process, okay. In the actual cycle it is non-isentropic, okay. That means entropy increases during the process because of the irreversibilities. That means you will find that entropy at 0.2 S2 dash will be greater than S1, whereas S2 is equal to S1, okay. So, this is one uh, difference. So, what is the consequence of this uh, difference? You will find that temperature T2 dash will be larger than uh, temperature T2, okay. Because of the irreversibility, you find that exit temperature is higher uh, compared to uh, the ideal isentropic process, okay. And process 2 to 3, uh, in actual this thing, this should have been uh, 0.2 should have been here, okay, and uh, the heat rejection should have taken place ideally along a constant pressure line. But you will fi find that because of fluid friction, there is a pressure drop here, okay. So, you find that uh, there is a reduction in pressure during the heat rejection process. Similarly, process 3 to 4, 3 to 4 entropy remains constant if it is an ideal process, but in an actual process again entropy increases. So, S4 dash will be greater than S3. Okay, so, the process is something like this. So, as a result you have a cycle uh, 1, 2 dash, 3 dash, 4 dash in an actual case. What is the consequence of this? You can very easily show that the consequence of this is a reduction in the COP, okay. The COP reduces because of two reasons. First reason is that your uh, cooling effect is reduced because in an isentropic process, uh, isentropic expansion process, the temperature should have been 4, but because of the irreversibility, now the temperature is 4 dash, okay. So, T4 dash is greater than T4, okay. And your uh, useful refrigeration effect QL is M dot Cp into T1 minus T4 dash in case of an actual uh, cycle, right. And in case of an ideal cycle, this will be T1, uh, T1 minus T4. Since T4 is lower than uh, T4 dash, obviously QL, da, QL in actual case will be smaller, okay. And uh, uh, we can also define uh, the actual uh, work of compression and actual work of turbine by defining uh, isentropic efficiencies, okay. For example, uh, uh, the actual work input to the compressor during the process 1 to 2 is defined as the isentropic work divided by the isentropic efficiency, okay. So, you can see that typically this isentropic efficiency of the compressor will always be less than 1. That means W12 actual will always be greater than W122 isentropic, okay. So, the required work input increases because of the uh, irreversibility, right. And the next uh, process that is uh, iso, iso isentropic expansion in the turbine, the work output of the turbine now gets reduced because of the uh, inefficiency, okay. And here again we define uh, uh, an isentropic efficiency for the turbine, okay. Again, this is lower than 1. So, the work output of the turbine will be lower than the work output of the ideal turbine, okay. So, the net result is that W net in an actual case will be much larger than W net of ideal case because uh, output is reducing and input is increasing, okay. And you can easily write the isentropic uh, efficiency for the compressor in terms of the enthalpies, okay. Now you let us look at the earlier diagram. So, it is uh, defined as the actual and then the enthalpy change divided by the enthalpy change for an isentropic process, okay. And uh, this can be written in terms of temperatures because we are assuming the Cp to be constant. So, isentropic efficiency of the compressor is written as T2 minus T1 divided by T2 dash minus T1. And if you remember uh, T2 was greater than T2 dash, okay. So, obviously, this isentropic efficiency will be, uh, I am sorry, I think it is, a, uh, it is other, uh, this thing, other way. T2 is actually lower because T2 dash is for the uh, isentropic process, okay. So, uh, this will be greater than 1, right. And for the turbine also, you can write the efficiency in terms of the temperatures, 
okay again this will be less than 1 okay because as you have seen the actual temperature at the exit of the uh, turbine will be higher than the uh, temperature in an isentropic process okay so as a result as i said just now the net work input increases right so uh, we find that uh, cop of actual uh, reverse breton cycles will be considerably lower than the ideal cycle because of these two effects reduction in the cooling output and increase in the uh, net work input uh, in fact the reduction could be quite considerable depending upon the design and one way of improving the uh, system performance is to design efficient compressors and turbines actually this is a very critical uh, issue okay so if you want to have a good efficiency you must have efficient uh, compressors and turbines now brayton cycles can be open or closed okay so far we have discussed a closed cycle okay that means the same amount of air is flowing through the cycle repeatedly but in actual case you can have a open cycle or a closed cycle so let us see what is an open cycle in open systems a uh, cold air at the exit of the turbine flows into the cold space and cold heat exchanger does not exist that means what we do in the in an open system is uh, air from the turbine is directly released into the cold space for example if you are using it for an aircraft cooling you directly release the cold air into the cabin of the aircraft okay so the air gets uh, heated up as it picks the heat from the cabin okay and then you take the air and send it to the compressor okay so you really don't have a, a low temperature heat exchanger okay so this is an open system right and there is no guarantee that the same air is flowing through the compressor okay uh, the advantage of this system is obviously uh, its simplicity and uh, since you don't have a cold uh, heat exchanger the total weight of the system will be reduced considerably okay that's the reason why we use this uh, in uh, aircraft cooling okay and second uh, characteristic is typically the low side pressure will be atmospheric when you are uh, releasing the air into an occupied space typically occupied space uh, pressure should be close to the atmospheric so the low side pressure also has to be close to the atmospheric okay so these are the two characteristics of open systems as again as this open system in a closed system we have two heat exchangers the high temperature heat exchanger and the low temperature heat exchanger and the air in the of the system does not get mixed with the outside air that means the same air flows through the cycle repeatedly and the one advantage of this system is that you can have low side pressure higher than the atmospheric okay such a cycle is known as dense air system that means you can operate your low side pressure at pressures much higher than the atmospheric typically 3 to 4 bar okay that means the air will be quite dense okay so you call these systems as dense air cycles what is the advantage of dense air cycles as you know as you are increasing the pressure the density increases specific volume reduces and for the same mass flow rate the amount of uh, vol uh, volume that you have to handle will be reduced considerably okay so that means volumetric flow rate of air reduces considerably so this will give you a lot of savings in in terms of uh, uh, heat exchanger sizes uh, compressor sizes etc okay so this is the advantage of dense air cycles okay so dense air cycles are obviously possible uh, only with closed cycle systems and uh, you can also use gases other than uh, air for example if you have a closed cycle uh, system uh, it is not necessary that you have to use air only okay you can also use other gases such as helium or uh, any other gas okay such systems exist for other applications other than aircraft cooling okay typically in aircraft cooling we use air uh, so and normally it will be uh, um, open okay now let us look at uh, aircraft cooling systems so why do we need first of all uh, air conditioning or cooling in an aircraft we know that uh, as you go up uh, typically aircraft will be flowing at very high altitudes it could be as high as uh, let's say 10 kilometers or even more so as you know that as you go up uh, the temperature and pressure both reduce in fact at an altitude of 10 kilometers outside temperature can be as low as minus 30 or minus 40 degrees centigrade okay when the outside temperature is so low why do you need a cooling system so maybe you, uh, you may be thinking that you require a heating system because outside temperature is very low and the required comfort temperature is about 21 degrees or so right so there is a large temperature difference between the inside and outside okay so if at all there is any heat transfer it should take place from the inside to the outside that means you require a heating system not a cooling system but you find that in actual practice we need a cooling system not a heating system when the aircraft is flying at high altitudes this is because of the following reasons okay 
the first reason is that there will be large internal heat generation okay so typically in an aircraft there will be a lot of uh, heat generation because of the occupants so normally they are very compact so a lot of occupants uh, will be there in the population density will be very high in a typical aircraft and everybody will be releasing heat okay due to metabolic rate and all so there is large heat generation in a small volume right so this will add to the uh, sensible and latent heats of the system okay so as a result temperature and uh, moisture content will increase Apart from the occupants, you can also have, uh, in fact, you will also have uh, a large uh, uh, amount of equipment which will be releasing heat, okay, many electronic controls, no motors, etc., okay, all these uh, equipment will be releasing heat uh, continuously. So, you have uh, continuous heat addition to the air inside the cabin because of the people and equipment, okay. So, if you, and this will not, uh, this will be much more. Uh, compared to the heat transfer from the cabin to the outside okay so if you don't provide any cooling system because the internal heat generation temperature can shoot up this is not the only reason you also require uh, uh, cooling because there will be heat generation due to skin friction typically aircraft will be moving at very high speed okay so when it is moving at very high speed in an air there will be large relative velocity okay so the boundary layers will develop uh, on the surface okay and since air is air has a finite viscosity as you have seen in the earlier classes there will be uh, frictional losses um, and because of the skin friction temperature rises okay the temperature of the body outside body will be higher because of the skin friction so there will be actually heat transfer from the surface of the body to the interior because of the skin friction okay so this is the second reason why you need a cooling system the third reason is the ram effect so because of the ram effect also the temperature of the air increases okay so i'll explain the ram effect um, uh, in a little while, uh, while. And the fourth effect is solar radiation. For example, if the aircraft is flying uh, during the daytime, then there can be considerable solar radiation. And because of solar radiation, uh, the temperature can go up. So these are the four reasons why we need a cooling system. Okay. Typically, if the aircraft is flying at low altitudes, at low velocities, then maybe you can do away with the air conditioning system. But if it is flying at uh, high speeds and at high altitudes, an air conditioning system is a must. Now, air cycle reference systems are preferred in aircraft. So, why do we use air cycle reference systems in aircraft? Because of the following reasons. The first reason is that obvious reason air is cheap, non toxic, and non flammable. Okay. Typically, you do not want to use any explosive or flammable gas in an aircraft. Okay. It has to be absolutely safe. So, air is the safest refrigerant that you can think of. It is easily available, it is non toxic, and non flammable. Okay. So, this is one of the main reasons why we use air in aircraft refrigeration okay and the second reason is the leakage of air is not a problem so leakage of air from the system is not a big problem and an open system can be employed eliminating cold heat exchanger as i was mentioning uh, just now if you are using air you can have an open system that means you can directly release the air into the system you need not have a cold heat exchanger what is the advantage of not having a cold heat exchanger as i have mentioned the system weight will be reduced considerably when you are designing an uh, air conditioning system for aircraft, the most important uh, criteria is the weight per uh, of kilowatt. Okay? So, the weight is a very important factor and the volume is also of, uh, uh, of course an important factor. The system that you choose must be lighter. Okay? So, you will fire see that uh, for aircraft air conditioning, the uh, air cycle systems will be lighter. Okay? Of one reason is you do not really require uh, a low, low temperature heat exchanger. Okay? And the fourth reason is main compressor of the aircraft itself can be used for compression. Okay. A typical uh, aircraft engine already has a compressor. Okay. So, uh, you also need a compressor for the air conditioning system. Okay. So, if you are using uh, uh, air cycle refrigeration for uh, air conditioning, you can use the main compressor of the engine itself for compression of the air. Okay. You do not require a separate compressor. So, you can see that you do not require a low temperature heat exchanger and you also do not require a, a separate compressor. So, this will lead to significant reduction in the weight. Okay? So, you will find that weight per kilowatt of an air cycle system will be much lower than a comparable vapor compression system for example, using a reciprocating compressor. In fact, the calculations show that the weight will be typically 50 percent that of the uh, comparable uh, vapor compression reference systems. Okay? So, this is the, uh, these are the reasons why we use Air, uh, air cycle reference systems in aircraft. Of course, the last reason is that this is, uh, the design of these systems are considerably simpler and the maintenance is also easy.
Okay, so these are the reason why we prefer air cycle system systems in aircraft. Now there are uh, different uh, types of systems used in different situations and for different types of aircrafts. Okay, for example, you can have what is known as a simple system. You can have a bootstrap system. You can have regenerative system. You can also have what is known as a reduced uh, or temperature system. Okay, there are other systems also. Okay, these are the three main systems. Uh, the fourth one as I said is reduced ambient system. Okay. So, each one has its own um, advantages and disadvantages and applications. Okay. Let us quickly look at these systems. The first one is what is known as simple aircraft refrigeration system or a simple system. Uh, this is an open system. The power or okay, let me first explain the cycle. Okay. So, um, uh, let me begin uh, at point 2 okay. uh, and uh, let look at the TS diagram first. Okay. So, this uh, point 1 is the ambient air. Okay. So, ambient air, the pressure and temperature of the ambient air are increased due to ram effect. Okay. Process 1 to 2 is what is known as the ram uh, ramming process okay during the ram uh, uh, ramming process its pressure and temperature increases okay so what we have basically at point 2 is ram air okay so ram air uh, goes to the main compressor okay mc is the main compressor of your uh, aircraft uh, engine right so it goes to the main uh, compressor it gets compressed from process 2 to 3 okay so a part of the compressed air goes to your uh, engine and a part of it goes to the uh, air conditioning system okay so at point 3 the air that is used for air conditioning system enters into an air cooler ac okay ac is the air cooler and how do we cool this air here we again use the ram air for cooling this air you can see that temperature at point 3 is much higher than the temperature at point 2 so you can use the ram air for cooling this air okay so the process 3 4 is what occurs in the after cooler so the temperature decreases almost isobarically uh, from 3 to 4 okay and ram air is used for cooling this and at this point at point 4 it enters into the cooling turbine t okay and it undergoes uh, expansion process 4 to 5 and as you know at this pro, uh, at this point you have a very cold air okay at point 5 so cold air at point 5 is uh, released into the cabin directly so okay so this air goes to the cabin and uh, in the cabin it picks up heat and by the time it comes out of the cabin its uh, condition will be at point i okay so process 5 to i is what has happened in the cabin right and uh, the power output of the turbine here is not used for running the compressor or anything it is used for running a fan okay so what does this fan do this fan drives the air through the after cooler okay so that means the power output of the turbine is used for uh, running the fan and the fan makes sure that sufficient uh, air flows through the uh, air cooler continuously okay so this is what is known as simple uh, system and here you can see that i have shown the actual cycle so you have some pressure drops here and non isentropic processes also so what is the refrigerant capacity of this system refrigerant capacity of this system is nothing but m dot cp into T i minus T 5 where T i is the cabin temperature. Okay. Now, let me uh, explain the ram effect. Ram effect is the, uh, uh, the pressure and temperature of the outside air increases as it comes in contact with the aircraft due to the conversion of kinetic energy into enthalpy. See, air may be still, but uh, the aircraft will be moving at very high speed. So, there will be a uh, large relative velocity between the air and the aircraft. Okay, so, when the air comes in contact with the, uh, the uh, high re relative velocity air comes in contact with the aircraft, its kinetic energy will be converted into enthalpy. Okay. So, the ultimately you have uh, the enthalpy being converted into temperature and pressure. Okay. So, you have because during this process uh, the kinetic energy is converted finally into pressure and temperature. Okay. So, this process is known as uh, ram uh, process or ram effect okay. and you can very easily show. Uh, show Oh, that the temperature rise during uh, ram effect is given by this relation okay t2 dash by t1 t2 dash is the temperature at the exit of the ram process t1 is the temperature of the ambient okay this is equal to 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 into m square okay where m is nothing but a mac number okay if you remember the mac number is defined as 
the ratio of the uh, velocity of the aircraft divided by the sonic velocity. So, A is the sonic velocity, right? And sonic velocity, as you know, is uh, for an ideal gas is equal to square root of gamma into r into T1, okay? And the ram efficiency, because the ram process is not strictly isentropic, you can define a ram efficiency as the actual pressure rise. This is the actual pressure rise and the pressure rise if the process is isentropic. Okay, so, we have the ram uh, temperature rise during the ra ramming and the pressure rise during the ram uh, process. Okay. So, as you can see that the power output of the cooling turbine is used for running the fan and this system is suitable for ground cooling. Why is it suitable for ground cooling? Because on the ground you do not have the ram effect. Okay, because of the ram effect the always there will be air flow on the uh, air cooler as long as it is moving, but on the ground the um, uh, aircraft is grounded. So, the but still the fan can drive the air. Okay, So, this system is uh, generally suitable for ground cooling and uh, this system is suitable for low speed, low altitude aircraft. Okay, So, simple systems are used for low speed and low altitude aircraft. The second system is what is known as a bootstrap system. Uh, let me very quickly explain uh, the bootstrap system. In the bootstrap system, uh, we have uh, two heat exchangers uh, and an auxiliary compressor. So, the ram air gets compressed in the main compressor M phi and uh, at this point it enters into the air cooler. So, 0 0.3 to 4 temperature reduces and at 0 0.4 again it is compressed in an auxiliary compressor from 0 0.4 to 5. Okay. So, the 0 0.4 to 5 is what happens in an auxiliary compressor okay. and at 0 0.5 again it gets cooled uh, as it flows through the uh, air cooler 2. Okay. So, during this process again the temperature drops from 5 to 6 and at this point it enters into the turbine and it undergoes the uh, expansion and at this point it goes to the cabin. Okay, so, you can see the difference between the simple system and the bootstrap system okay. and here the power output of the turbine is used for running the compressor right? and the ram air is used for, the, for cooling the air cooler uh, 1 and air cooler 2 because okay, the same ram air is used. right? So, obviously you can see that this system is not really good for uh, ground cooling because uh, when it is on ground you do not have any ram air. So, the air coolers cannot be cooled. So, normally you do not use this system for ground cooling. You normally use it for uh, high uh, speed, uh, high altitude flights. So, as I said suitable for high speed aircraft flying at high altitude. It uses uh, two compressors two heat exchangers and not suitable for ground cooling. The other system is what is known as regenerative system. I will not explain this system, but I will just tell the uh, uh, briefly. Uh, in a regenerative system, a part of the cold air from cooling turbine is used for pre-cooling the air entering the turbine. That means, what is done is you take uh, some cold air from the cooling turbine and use the same cold air for pre-cooling the air. Okay. So, that means the air entering into the turbine will be pre-cooled. Okay. So, the advantage of this is that exit temperature of the turbine will be very cold. Okay. So, in a, a typical regenerative system you can get very cold air. Okay. Of course, this is, this is at the cost of uh, increased uh, weight and design complexity. And uh, one last thing is uh, uh, all the uh, different aircraft uh, cooling systems are compared uh, based on an index called uh, dry air rated temperature or DART. Okay. DART stands for dry air rated temperature. It is defined as the temperature of air at the exit of the cooling turbine in the absence of any moisture condensation. Okay. That means, uh, when the air is very dry and as it undergoes expansion, there should not be any moisture condensation. Okay. Under such cases, what is the temperature at the exit of the turbine? That is called as dry air rated temperature okay, and this is the index used for comparing different systems. Uh, and normally the aircraft systems are uh, rated based on the mass flow rate of air. Okay. So, the rating is done based on the mass flow rate of air and the refrigeration capacity is obviously given by a mass flow rate of air m dot into C p into T i minus D A R T design uh, uh, D A R T that means design dry air rated temperature and T i is the cabin temperature. And, uh, m dot is the mass flow rate of the air. Okay. And a comparison of different aircraft refrigerant systems based on DART at different Mach number shows that uh, DART increases monotonically for all systems except reduced ambient system and simple system is good at low Mach numbers 
and at high Mach numbers we have to use either bootstrap system or regenerative system and the reduced ambient system is generally good for supersonic aircraft. Okay, let me quickly conclude what we have learned in this uh, particular lecture. Uh, we have discussed the reverse Carnot cycle and its limitations and we have discussed ideal and actual reverse Brayton cycles and we have looked at various uh, aircraft refrigerant cycles and we have also seen the concept of dry air rated temperature and uh, as I mentioned the performance of all the above systems can be obtained very easily using the basic thermodynamic concepts which we have discussed in the earlier lessons and also in this particular lesson. Okay. Right, thank you.